So um, we're going to stick with our bio theme here and uh, hear a little bit more research. So next we have Susan Snyder, and she is a PhD student at the University of South Florida um, in their College of Marine Sciences. She's working at Dr. Steve Morawski's lab, and they're working, um, they're part of the Gomery Sea Image Consortia, so that's um, the Center for Integrated Modeling and Analysis of Gulf Ecosystems. So she's going to talk a little bit about some of her work today, where she's looking at the metabolites in bile of three species, um, and I'll let her talk more about that since she's the expert. So here's Susan. And when you point the thing, if you don't mind using the mouse here, that way people the mouse is probably about online. Okay. Morning, everyone. I'm Susan Snyder. I'm a PhD student at the University of South Florida under the supervision of Dr. Steve Morocki. And today I'm going to talk to you about bile and how we use bile as a tool for detecting oil exposure. But first of all, I'd like to let you know that this research and the associated data are open access online, free for you to download. Um, here's the heading of the paper. If you just type in the title, type in my name, again, it's free for you to download. And we've heard a lot this morning about how oil is a very complex mixture made up of a lot of different components. I studied a component of oil called the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or the PAHs. PAHs are known to be a small but toxic component of oil. And they're a small component in the sense that Deepwater Horizon crude was only about 4% PAHs. However, when you have a blowout that releases over 200 million gallons of oil into the environment, it's a large pulse of these toxic compounds going out into the ecosystem. So how are PAHs toxic? Um, Dr. Dubansky covered this a little bit. They've been associated with a variety of sublethal effects in fish that include DNA damage, liver lesions, and liver cancer, skin lesions, like you can see in the photographs of red snapper here, um, immune system suppression, cardiotoxicity, like he mentioned, in developing fish, reduced growth rate due to that cost of metabolism, um, gill abnormalities, hormone disruption, specifically with the reproductive hormones. Um, and a little bit more about the chemistry of PAHs. Again, we said they're polycyclic hydrocarbons. So they're made up of two or more hydrocarbon rings. Here we have the chemical uh, structure of a very common oil-related pH called naphthalene. It's a two-ring compound. I work with naphthalene. Right now I work with two other PAHs, the three-ring molecule in the middle, uh, phenanthrene, and the five-ring molecule, benzoapyrene. But today I'm just going to talk about naphthalene and benzoapyrene results. In our data, phenanthrene mimics naphthalene. Uh, so in order to avoid presenting redundant information, I'm going to leave phenanthrene out of the talk. Um, here's a graph showing you the pH composition in deep water horizon oil. It's a little complex, so I'm going to simplify it, breaking it down by kind of the different classes of pHs. Um, so on the bottom, you can see the naphthalenes in green, the phenanthrenes in orange, and then benzoapyrene up at the top. You can't see a bar for it. Um, benzoapyrene is found in very small concentration in deep water horizon oil, however it is detected, but it's in, as you can see here, much lower concentrations than the naphthalene or the phenanthrene. So again, I'm showing you this because not all pHs are found in equal concentration in oil. Um, and pHs are not just specific to oil. They're ubiquitous environmental pollutants on land and in the ocean. There are many sources of pHs to the Gulf of Mexico, which we've said already, natural seeps, riverine input, specifically, you know, the Mississippi River is a large river, atmospheric deposition, the oil industry, ships, your cars, lots of sources of pHs to the Gulf. And um, if you look below the waterline here in this figure, you can see there are many sinks of pHs in the Gulf of Mexico as well. First is the food web. PAHs can make it into the marine food web. Second is the water. PAHs can be detected in the water, specifically following oil spills. However, we said they're hydrocarbons. They really don't like to be in the water. They'd much prefer to end up in the sediment. The sediment is a large reservoir for PAHs. 
And scientists have now estimated that about 2 to 14 percent of Deepwater Horizon oil release has settled into Gulf of Mexico sediments, where it is bioavailable to fish. Here's a pie graph showing you the oil budget for 2010 for the Gulf of Mexico. We said there are many sources of oil to the Gulf, many sources of PAHs. However, in 2010, the Deepwater Horizon blowout made up 88 percent of oil input to the Gulf of Mexico. So again, that's a large pulse of oil, a large pulse of PAHs into the ecosystem. And today I'm going to talk to you about exposure to PAHs, exposure to chemicals. I'm not going to get into accumulation in tissues or health effects. So far I've just worked with biomarkers of exposure. And you can think about routes of exposure just like you would um, in a human. So for fish, we have three routes of exposure. The first is ingestion. Fish can ingest contaminated prey. Like we said, PAHs can make it into the food web. Or they can ingest contaminated sediment. Certain fish do ingest sediment, which we'll talk about. Second is inhalation. If there are PAHs or other chemicals in the water, um, just like you would be exposed to any airborne pollutants through your lungs, a fish can inhale these compounds over the gills, which are their organ for gas exchange. And then third is the dermal route. Just like you would put on like a topical Benadryl cream and you would absorb that medicine, for fish, it's thought that they can be exposed to chemicals dermally. So I work with three species, three Gulf of Mexico species shown here. The first is golden tilefish. They're quite a large, uh, somewhat commercially important species in the Gulf of Mexico. Second is the king snake eel. You might not have ever heard about the king snake eel. Uh, we catch them quite a lot in the Gulf. And they're, there's not a lot known about them. They're quite a large, kind of vicious creature. Quite interesting to study. So here is a king snake eel, and then there's me on the right. So you can see they're quite large. And if you get out your tape measure, we measured this king snake eel to be 2.26 meters, or about 7 feet 4 inches. So if anything, they're really interesting to study because there's barely anything known about them. They're quite large. They're quite interesting to pull up on your line. And then last, we have the red snapper. Um, you're probably very familiar with them, a very commercially important species in the Gulf, very iconic Gulf of Mexico species. And it's known that certain species are prone to higher levels of exposure to contaminants. Here we have three bottom-dwelling species. Um, and again, because deep water horizon oil is thought to be residual in the sediments, that's why we chose bottom-dwelling species. And even between these three species, we believe they could be exposed to different levels of contaminants based on their behavior, based on their lifestyle. So for golden tilefish, we hypothesized they could first be exposed to pHs through ingestion of contaminated sediments. Golden tilefish are known to be burrowers. They dig these large funnel-shaped burrows for the protection from predators, and it's thought that they, they don't migrate. They stick in one area with, you know, maybe one burrow for their whole life. And they have been observed cleaning and maintaining these burrows. When you live at the bottom of the ocean, especially offshore the Mississippi River, there's a lot of sediment coming down. So they are observed using their mouth to clean out and maintain their burrow. So we believe that's going to be a key route of exposure to contaminants for golden tilefish. And when we dissect them, it's very evident that they are ingesting sediments. They also could be ingesting contaminated prey. They do eat uh, demersal prey, prey that lives on the bottom. And then third, possibly any dermal uptake when they're in their burrow, are they maybe absorbing pHs dermally? Second, for the king snake eel, they're also known to eat benthic prey, so maybe that's a route of contamination. And possibly any dermal uptake while burrowing. Again, there's very limited literature on the king snake eel, but what is out there suggests they have a very strong association with the sediments. Um, however, we don't think they form permanent, lifelong burrows like a tilefish. We guess that maybe they're kind of wriggling into the sediment to hunt or to search for food, to hide from predators. But again, that could be a route of exposure. And then last for the red snapper, they're a reef fish. They're more associated with vertical structure than, you know, direct physical contact with the sediments. So we believe they could be exposed through uh, contaminated prey. Again, they also eat benthic prey. So we set up this gradient here where we believe we have three species with um, golden tilefish on the left, you know, high association with the sediments, 
We think that would lead to higher exposure to contaminants, higher levels of PAH as measured. We're on the right, we have red snapper, lower levels of association with the sediments, um, maybe lower levels of contaminants measured. And we collect our fish um, every summer. We go out long lining in the northern Gulf. We've been doing this since 2011. On the left, we have our map showing our long lining stations in gray. And we have been long lining um, in the northern Gulf from the West Florida Shelf to west of the Mississippi River. And on the right, we have a picture of a gallbladder. So the gallbladder is very important to us. One of the main things we collect is the bile. From these fish, we also take other tissues, muscle, liver, otoliths, spleen, et cetera, other data like length, weight, sex, organ weight. And from 2011 to 2015, so far we've collected samples um, for these three species from over 700 fish. So why bile? What's so important about bile? So here we're going to go through a schematic. Um, we've got a cartoon of benzoapyrene. And just like you can think about this with alcohol, if there's alcohol in your system, just like benzoapyrene, it's going to make it to your liver, where it's going to be acted on by enzymes and metabolized into a chemical, like shown here, a metabolite. And these metabolites are created because they're easier to eliminate. Again, fish, humans, we don't want these compounds in our body, so we're metabolizing them to eliminate them. And then as they're being eliminated, these metabolites are stored in the bile, which is stored in the organ, the gallbladder. And um, bile has a quick turnover rate. So the purpose of bile is to aid in digestion. So whenever you eat, whenever a fish eats, bile is moved from your gallbladder into your intestine to aid in the digestion of lipids. So this is our biomarker here, that when we find, when we have the presence of pH metabolites in bile, that's a biomarker that a fish has been exposed to these compounds within the past few days because, again, bile has a quick turnover rate. Um, however, toxicity of these compounds is related to their metabolism. So we have this metabolite of benzoyapyrene here in the middle. It can be metabolized a few steps more down the line into this molecule here, which is a known carcinogen. Again, it looks a lot more reactive than uh, the parent molecule. And it is. This molecule is known to bind irreversibly with your DNA, forming this molecule down here in the bottom corner. That's a DNA adduct. And um, again, this is how these, specifically benzoyapyrene, is known to be toxic, causing DNA damage, possibly liver lesions, liver cancers. So what we do, it's just like drug testing a fish. Just like if you wanted to drug test an athlete, you'd get a urine sample, you'd take that urine sample and you'd look in it for metabolites of a drug. We collect bile and we look in bile for metabolites of oil, just like drug testing a fish. Back in the lab, we take this bile and we run it on uh, this instrument here called High Performance Liquid Chromatography with fluorescence detection. And our results come out in concentrations of metabolites of naphthalene, phenanthrene, and benzoapyrene in the bile. To date, we've analyzed about 400 bile samples from these three species. And for 2015, um, we've already done our field work. We've collected about 185 more bile samples that are sitting in queue waiting to be run. I'm going to go through my results. Again, it's going to be a lot of graphs of chemical concentrations. First here, we have naphthalene metabolites between our three species. Um, so just as we expected, golden tilefish had significantly higher levels of naphthalene metabolites compared to the other two species. But what we didn't expect was that king snake eel would have uh, very low and even the lowest levels that we've measured. And however, um, pH metabolites are a very common validated biomarker of exposure to pHs. However, here we are comparing three different species. So these data could be reflecting not only differences in exposure, but differences in physiology. Maybe there's some physiological difference between the three species, especially with the king snake eel, maybe leading to them having a high, lower level of pH metabolite. Looking at our naphthalene results over time, uh, with red snapper, we started sampling red snapper in 2011. And since 2011, we've seen a 59% decrease in the concentration of naphthalene metabolites. For king snake eel, we started working with them in 2012. And since 2012, we've seen a 47% decrease over time. And this to us suggests that um, sometime for red snapper prior to 2011, 
there was an episodic exposure event where there were higher levels of naphthalene in the environment that red snapper were exposed to. And since then, uh, those levels of contamination have declined and that's been reflected in our biomarker. Although, however, again, there are many sources of PHs to the environment. But naphthalene results over time for golden tilefish are quite different. There's no significant difference over time, um, no decrease, if anything, maybe a slight increase. And we think this is, again, due to their burrowing lifestyle. If PAHs are sequestered in the sediment, and if tilefish are constantly burrowing and digging into the sediments with their mouth, that could be a route of continual exposure to these contaminants over time. And in studies of demersal fish following the Exxon Valdez oil spill, they had elevate, elevated levels of pH metabolites in the bile for over 10 years, showing, again, um, persistent exposure to contaminants. Looking at our benzoapyrene results, again, now we're on to that bigger five-ring pH, we saw no significant decrease between species. And I need to note here that benzoapyrene is quite a different molecule than naphthalene, although they are both pHs. Uh, benzoapyrene is a much larger, bulkier molecule, and we expect it to act differently than naphthalene. It's going to have a different bioavailability to these fish and a different um, way of being metabolized. So again, no significant difference here between the three species. And we are measuring benzoapyrene metabolites on a much lower level than the naphthalene metabolites. Um, here we've got we measure benzoapyrene on the parts per billion level, whereas our naphthalene metabolites were measured on the parts per million level. Looking at benzoapyrene metabolites over time, for red snapper and golden tilefish, we did not see any significant trends over time, maybe a couple bumps up and down, um, but really no change over time. With king snake eel, we did see a decrease over time, a 60% decrease. And again, this could be due to exposure, um, episodic exposure to higher levels of benzoapyrene in the environment prior to 2012. Looking at spatial variation, again, I said we sampled from the West Florida Shelf to west of the Mississippi River. And on the West Florida Shelf, we mainly catch red snapper. We don't catch a lot of tilefish or king snake eels. Um, so I've grouped our red snapper into two groups, the West Florida Shelf group and the Northern Gulf of Mexico or NGOM group. And for both naphthalene and benzoapyrene metabolites, there's significantly higher levels measured in red snappers taken from the northern gulf compared to those taken on the west Florida shelf. Um, however, in the northern gulf, again, that's where the deep water has and blowout occurred, but that's also where there's the active oil industry, the Mississippi River, many more sources of pH as compared to the west Florida shelf. And lastly, I want to put our results into perspective. So I did a little digging and I pulled up as many studies that I could find that used very similar lab methods to quantify pH metabolites in bile. Again, that's that high performance liquid chromatography um, method. And just a note that many of these studies are coming from Gina Lee Tallow's lab. She's going to speak later today. Um, so I ranked our data uh, denoted with the stars compared to these other studies. And if we focus first on the left-hand side, the naphthalene graph, um, you can see that our tilefish data are playing out quite high on this graph. However, they are falling below pink salmon sampled after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Uh, however, those salmon were sampled pretty immediately following the Exxon Valdez, whereas these tilefish data were taken over two years post Deepwater Horizon. But the good news is lower on the graph, we've got our red snapper samples and our king snake eel samples, and they are playing out um, much lower right around some 1993 Gulf of Mexico, Texas, um, what you could call baseline data that we found. And then if you look on the right, uh, the benzoapyrene figure, all three of our samples are playing out in the lower end of this graph, which is good news. And again, benzoapyrene is a very different pH than naphthalene. It's a very urban and industrial pH. It's a combustion product. So you would expect to see it in higher levels in um, you know, big urban estuaries like Los Angeles, San Diego Bay, Puget Sound, compared to you know, in, on the continental shelf in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico where we're catching our red snapper, our tilefish, you wouldn't expect to see high levels of benzoapyrene. So again, it's good news we're getting very low levels comparatively for benzoapyrene exposure. And lastly, I want to touch on our future work. We're really excited about a lot of the future work going on in sea image. Um, 
First, like I mentioned, we don't just take bile from these fish. We, fish, we take a lot of other tissues, including liver and muscle. So I'm going to do pH analysis on the liver and muscle tissues from these individuals, trying to understand if pHs are accumulating in their tissues. And we don't just catch uh, tilefish and snapper. We catch a lot of other species, including the groupers, sharks, the hakes. We sample them as well, and we've got another scientist in the lab working on pH analysis for those species. Second, um, we've got liver tissues saved to do histological analysis. I'm hoping I get to do that work um, where we're looking at liver tissues to see if there are any abnormalities, any lesions, any cancers, and then we can correlate that with the pH data. We also want to correlate with immune system function markers. We've got a student in the lab developing markers for immune system function in these same individuals. So I want to correlate my data with her to see if, if a fish has higher levels of PAHs, do they have a compromised immune system? And then lastly, something I think you'll be really excited about, we are working to establish a golf-wide PAH baseline. So on the map here in the left, uh, the yellow dots are where we've sampled historically in the northern Gulf. On the bottom, you can see there's some white dots. This summer, um, we spent a month offshore of Mexico longlining. And down there, we caught the same species. We caught golden tilefish, we caught red snapper, we caught king snake eel. So we can do some really exciting spatial comparisons between the northern Gulf and the southern Gulf. In offshore of Mexico, you have very pristine blue waters out on the, uh, the Yucatan Shelf. But then down here in the Bay of Campeche, you have where, that's where Mexico has their very active uh, oil industry. And that's also where in the 70s they had a very similar submarine blowout called the X-Tox blowout happened down there. We sampled there. Um, so we're very excited about that. And the next summer in this map we're going to go out, we're going to fill in the blanks, we're going to go to the Texas coast, and we're going to fill in some spots we missed off of Mexico. Uh, so if the next blowout occurs, we are prepared with pH baseline data for the entire Gulf and also some um, other biomarkers as well. So uh, thanks, thanks to Sea for having me. Thanks for everyone who's worked with me out in the field and on land. And um, take questions later. Mm -hmm.